Namaste. Good evening and welcome all. My name is Sevakumar Kasetti and uh, I'm one of the Asifa India volunteers. I also volunteer for ACM SIGGRAPH and SIGGRAPH Asia. On the professional front, I'm a production and recruitment consultant. I currently work for uh, Monk Studios in Thailand. So uh, today I'll be curating this webinar along with my friend RK Ramakrishna Garu. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity and recognize and thank my fellow volunteers from Asifa India team. Uh, Sanjay ji, founder of uh, Horizon Institute of Design and also runs uh, Arena Animation in Indoor. RK Ramakrishna Garu, founder and CEO of uh, ISCG and other, other production houses in Hyderabad. Vinod Garu, he has been very uh, like uh, kind and supporting uh, in all the finance and operational aspects of uh, Asifa India. Then I would like to introduce Sesha Prasad. Uh, Sesha Prasad is currently the head of production for DNEG India. And uh, Sesha Prasad is the captain of uh, Asifa India. Then I would like to introduce uh, Vani Saraswati. The, uh, like she is an independent uh, director and producer. And uh, Vani is the president of uh, Asifa India. I would also like to thank all the Asifa India city evangelists uh, who has been helping us uh, from across India and uh, like contribute in the success of this uh, Asifa India webinars. Without them, uh, it would not have been possible to have this kind of reach and uh, success. Uh, to know more about Asifa India, please do visit our website, asifaindia.com. And uh, for all the future updates, we request you to like us and follow us on Facebook. Asifa India page. Uh, we would like to thank our event supporters, SIGGRAPH Asia and uh, CTN Expo. And we would also like to thank our uh, media partners, Animation World Network, awn.com, and also Animation Express for being our media partners. Now it takes immense pleasure to invite you all for the fourth ECG Meetup webinar, Animation in Anatomy by Dr. Stuart Sumida. My friend R.K. Ramakrishna Garu will be curating uh, like further. I request R.K. Garu to take over. Hi, guys. Very good evening. Happy Vinayak. Uh, I mean, Ganesh Chaturthi. Ganesh Chaturthi. Ganesh itself is known like he's a hybrid character of a human and an animal. I mean, uh, elephant. Wow. What a magic. I think like that magic at that time, probably Lord Shiva's magic is the thing what was happened. But today, to really show a life in a creature or an animal, it's very, very tough for the animation world or a virtual VFX world. In that scenario, today we got Dr. Sumeda, who is a scientist, biologist, and professor at California State University. And what not, he's an advisor for larger studios like Warner Brothers, Sony Pictures, Sony Imageworks, uh, MPC, Double Negative, Digital Domain, Framestorm, Blue Sky, whatnot. You name whichever the studio is, he's in the top. And he's been part of the movies like Jurassic Park, Utopia. Uh, I mean, uh, How to Train Your Dragon, like a lot money, Life of Pi, God, uh, uh, Guardians of Galaxy, and Jumanzi, what not, any movie that is relinked with creatures or animals, he's a person to be called as. So it is our honor to invite him as our speaker to enlighten us with the knowledge what he had uh, throughout his life. Thank you, uh, sir. I mean, thanks for making your day. Very good morning for you. I think it's too early for you to get up make you to get up and uh, my fellow Indians are okay uh, today a bit lazy due to the festival but it's never less we want to end up with your great knowledge session thank you sir thank you RK thank you Shiva uh, welcome Stuart uh, this is super exciting I also just wanted to say that we're actually celebrating this year 20 years of uh, Asifa in India and 60 years of ASIFA internationally. So this is like a big moment for us to have um, someone amazing like you to, to take your 
you know, time and come and be a part of uh, the celebration with all of us. Welcome. Thank you very much. Well, thank you everybody for having me. This is um, a, a great honor for me. Uh, it is um, uh, uh, very special for me. I am a, actually a, a member of ASIFA Hollywood here in California. Uh, so I am an ASIFA member like many of you, um, but it is, it is uh, important to me as a scientist to uh, help to uh, um, facilitate the friendships that we have uh, between the, not only the sciences and the arts, but between uh, different um, uh, countries and different cultures. Uh, and especially at this time that is so unusual uh, for the world uh, and for, the, uh, uh, for our, our difficulties in dealing with this, this global pandemic, I, I think that there is incredible power uh, in uh, uh, the way we can uh, come together. Uh, what, what all of you do with art to reach the world is important. What we do in science is important, but we don't always uh, do a very good job of getting people to listen to us, whereas you are very good at that. Uh, so uh, I think if we join, uh, if we join forces, uh, we can be a very powerful um, uh, factor uh, for good and for progress in the world. But I don't want to get too dramatic right now. This should be a fun day. I am a university professor. I promise I am not going to make this like a lesson uh, in class, especially on a, a special day like today. Uh, I do appreciate you having me on, on a, such an important holiday uh, and you taking your time to do so. So if it's all right, um, I'm going to uh, let you start to see my screen. I'm gonna open up a file and talk to you a little bit about the kinds of things that I do with different kinds of studios. I'm not going to give you a bunch of lessons. I'm as a, instead, I'm gonna give you some examples of the kinds of things we do uh, so we can see what some of the possibilities happen to be. So give me a moment while I open my screen. One second now. Oops. Um, that's my desktop. So let me get my PowerPoint moving for you. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about why the magic that you make on screen is uh, uh, so scientifically based. Now, you know this, okay? uh, the, the animation and visual effects industries these days are very, very uh, powerfully uh, supported by uh, computer engineering. Uh, pretty much all of you as artists now are also computer scientists. So it's not new to you uh, that uh, science and art go together. Uh, the kind of science that I do uh, is actually uh, what some people might call a very old fashioned kind of science. And I'm gonna uh, tell you a tiny bit about that in my first part of what we do today. I'm gonna talk to you about some early history uh, both myself and, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and within the industry. And then I'm gonna give you some examples of some of the kinds of projects that we have worked on. Uh, our goal will be to uh, take a part of this hour uh, to chat about those kinds of things. And then um, we'll uh, leave uh, the latter part of the hour open uh, for questions and answers. But just a little bit of background, just a little bit of background to start, okay? Uh, I am a paleontologist. Now, when you say, tell someone they're a paleontologist, the very first thing that everybody says is, oh, dinosaurs, dinosaurs, dinosaurs. And <laughs> I got to tell you that I don't study dinosaurs, at least not too much, okay? Uh, this is the only uh, sexy animal that I study. It's an animal called Dimetrodon. And I know that a lot of people think it's a dinosaur. It is not. It is in all the little plastic dinosaur toy kits, but it is not a dinosaur. Uh, it is actually an animal that is more closely related to mammals like you and me uh, than it is to dinosaurs. And it lived about 60 million years before the, the first dinosaur ever even showed up. Now, before anybody even asks what that big sale was for, we don't know. Okay, we don't know. Um, everybody says it's for warming up in the sun and cooling off in the shade and it 
probably wasn't. Uh, whenever you see something really big and really stupid looking that would have no help to the animal whatsoever in life, it's probably to show off to get dates with the opposite sex. Okay. But we'll worry about that later. Okay. Now I can tell you that in my own career, some of the non-dinosaurian things that I've studied have intersected with art. So if you look at this little picture of this little fossil right here, you'll notice from the bar scale that it's quite small. It's about the size of a lizard. It also lived 60 million years before a dinosaur ever walked the earth. But the interesting thing about this animal is that if you look very, very closely, it has very short arms and very, very long legs. And I could tell you all about it, but it's much better to use a picture, okay? Uh, so if you take a look at that picture, that reconstruction of that animal, we have actually determined that it is the first animal to run around on its hind legs. Now I can give you tons of data on that, but a picture is worth many, many, many words. And so here's a great example of how even a scientist like me needs art to do what we do. Now, if we return to that animal that I first showed you, there are some of those spines from that big sail that you saw. And, you know, some of them look nice and pretty and straight, but, you know, sometimes they look all gnarly and, and bent and broken and beaten, uh, sort of like, you know, Mr. Burns's fingernails or something like that. Uh, and, and for the longest time, people thought, well, this is a fossil. It's been in the ground for many, many millions of years. It's, 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 been a little bit distorted, but what, what uh, colleagues of, of mine and I have found out is in fact that that's what they actually look like. And I could go on and on and on about that, but instead it's much better to give you a picture, isn't it? Now that's a very interesting looking animal. It is the same animal, but we now know a bit more about it, don't we? And it looks a little bit more interesting, a bit more organic, which makes a little bit of sense. But I can tell you that this uh, reconstruction of that animal Dimetrodon by Michael Skrepnik, an, uh, an artist uh, colleague of mine who's very, very talented. If you like fossils and dinosaurs and such things, look up Michael Skrepnik and I'll give you his name at the end. He's a brilliant, brilliant uh, artist. And this is a great way of communicating, of course. So we see even in my field that if you put the art together with the science, of course, it's very, very powerful. Okay. Now, I'm a paleontologist and yes, even though I don't study dinosaurs specifically, we have done a bit of work with dinosaurs. There is a skull of the world's most famous dinosaur. That's the skull of a Tyrannosaurus rex. There aren't as many uh, T-rexes out there as you might expect. Uh, only a couple dozen uh, specimens really and only a few complete ones, uh, but it is a very, very popular animal. And so of course, as a paleontologist, even though I don't study T-Rex specifically. I have to know about it to talk to my students uh, and I have to know about it to teach my classes. Right? Now, the great thing about dinosaurs is that they've had a massive and important role in the history of our, of our, of our genre, of, of, of our, our, our professions. The very first character animation probably was Gertie the Dinosaur, which was over uh, 100 years ago. Now, it's very interesting. If you look at this timeline, barely a quarter of a century after Gertie, we had already made it to the level of, of, of expertise that you see in Fantasia. And I know that many people think that the Sorcerer's Apprentice scene in Fantasia is one of the landmark moments um, in, uh, in the film. And it is. Uh, however, However, for, my, for, my, for, for, for me, uh, the Rite of Spring sequence with all of the, the prehistoric animals, of course, is, is very, very exciting. So now what about moving on? Well, take a look at how long it took us to get to Jurassic Park, about 50 years, okay? That is very interesting. Uh, now, the very first Jurassic Park film, and I'm a paleontologist, don't get me wrong. It was a very, very exciting moment. And a lot of people will tell you, oh, Dr. Sumita, Dr. Sumita, did you hate Jurassic Park? I bet you hated Jurassic Park. Tell me about all the mistakes in Jurassic Park. And my response is, well, no, um, we really quite liked Jurassic Park. We were very excited to see Jurassic Park. As paleontologists, we've been waiting to see that on screen all our lives. So I didn't hate the dinosaurs in Jurassic Park. I love the dinosaurs in Jurassic Park. It was the people in Jurassic Park who were stupid. Okay, I'm just saying. 
but Jurassic Park is not a movie about paleontology. It's a monster movie with dinosaurs in it, and the dinosaurs are good, and they they should they should uh, uh, be appreciated for what they are. Now, one of the things that's interesting, if you take a look at those dates, the amount of time, about 25 or 26 years, from Gertie to Fantasia is about the same amount of time from Jurassic Park to Jurassic World. The amount of progress that's been made in the same amount of time is remarkable. And I know that a lot of you work very hard and sometimes it is very difficult to remember, but remember that you are part of history and a part of history that is moving at an incredible pace as you entertain the world. Uh, and so imagine uh, what has happened between the first Jurassic Park and what some of you are working on now. Uh, and I think that uh, gives them perspective for, for what we all do. Okay, so uh, that little bit of history of dinosaurs, well, that's not the only part of science that's been important uh, in animation and film. And here's one of my favorite images. This is from the, the one of, arguably one of the most famous unpublished documents in animation history. And I'm sure many, many of you uh, recognize it already. This is a, a skeleton of a deer. Uh, and you probably already know the scene, even if I don't tell you, uh, this is a deer skeleton slipping on the ice. This is the scene of Bambi slipping on the ice in the film Bambi many, many, many years ago. And the artwork that was done in preparation for this film, blocking out the entire film skeletally, was done by Rico Lebrin and the artists at Disney because they understood and appreciated that if they understood the construction and anatomy of the character, that they would do a better job animating it. So we continue to do this uh, both in paleontology uh, for what I do. Uh, there you can see on the left side of your screen, uh, a reconstruction of a, an extinct uh, wolf from the La Brea Tar Pits right here in Southern California. Uh, and uh, that was done by Mauricio Antone, a really, really talented artist. Uh, and on the other side of your screen, you can see a very similar approach to building the character named Bolt from the, uh, uh, the Disney film of the same uh, name uh, by uh, Jin Kim, who is also a very, very talented artist. They're con what we say in, in, in biology, it's called convergent evolution, where, you, where you, you wind up doing similar things because of similar pressures. And what we see in the convergence of Jin and Mauricio is this understanding that an organism is more than just an outline, that there is depth to it and that there is construction to it. Okay. So people like me study things like this. And I love this image. These are skeletons from the Museum of Natural History in Paris, where they have some of the most beautiful articulated skeletons in the world. And this lets me introduce to you my introduction into the world, <clears throat> excuse me, of, uh, uh, of art and animation. I have to give credit where credit is due. The person who introduced me to this entire process is a gentleman named Charles Solomon. And one day Charles, uh, called me. I was uh, uh, fresh out of graduate school, just, just beginning my life as an academic. And, and I had known Charles through graduate school, and we used to hang out together. And uh, I used to talk to his friends in the animation department, and he used to talk to my friends in the biology department at the University of California in Los Angeles. And he called me one day. I was teaching at the University of Chicago. And he said, you know how we always used to hang out and talk with the artists? And I said, yeah. And he says, well, some of them were wondering if you'd be willing to talk to them now that they have jobs. I said, oh, well, that would be fun. I was in Chicago and it was in the winter and it was about zero degrees at the time. Uh, so going back to somewhere sunny and warm was very appealing. And, they, and he told me that the artists were concerned that they didn't know how to do proper animation of horses and wolves. And I said, well, the answer to that to me is very quickly is that horses are plant eaters and wolves are meat eaters. And he said, look, they don't wanna learn biology. I said, no, 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 let me, let me explain. A little bit of biology will explain a lot of animation. So let me give you that example very, very quickly. If you're a horse, 
you eat plants and many animals eat plants. They're herbivores. On the other hand, there are some animals that don't. There are some animals that eat meat. And this, by the way, is not to offend anybody who is a vegetarian. I understand entirely. We're talking about animals and we're not talking about people. But if you take a look at these two animals, they're shaped differently and they move differently. And believe it or not, it's because of what they eat. Plants are difficult to digest, relatively speaking because they have lots of what we call roughage or cellulose in them. Whereas meat is relatively easier to digest, it doesn't have any of that. So if you eat lots of plants, like a horse, okay, you have to eat more food to get the nutrition you need because that roughage does not contain nutrition. On the other hand, if you eat meat, like this cheetah, okay, or a wolf for that matter, uh, all of the mass you put into your body is available to you as energy. So you don't need to eat as much. So your digestive tract does not have to be as big. So what happens is if you eat plants, you have a big digestive tract. If you have you eat meat, you have a, a slightly shorter one, which means that plant eaters need to carry around more guts. So as I like to say, you are what you eat. That means that plant eaters are bigger and uh, consider the difference in size of a horse or even a tiger. Horses are bigger, okay? Now to carry all of that weight, they have a backbone that is incredibly stiff and incredibly strong. If you look at that picture of that horse, its backbone shape does not change as it runs because it can't. But if you look at that carnivore, that meat eater, it is much more flexible because it can be. And this is because of what they eat, okay? Even the, and here's where it starts to get interesting for animation, even the pattern in which their feet touch the ground when they run is different because of what they eat. Carnivores do what's called a rotary gallop, where you will have one hind foot, then the other, then a front and then another front lance. So you will go, for example, in this carnivore, right, left, left, right, repeat. It's like going around a circle, as opposed to what happens when you're a wide-bodied herbivore, you go right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left. You alternate sides so you don't tip over because you're a broad barrel-shaped animal. So what you eat not only determines your shape and flexibility, it even determines the pattern of your footfalls when you run. Okay? So here's a little illustration I did for that. Uh, and what I'll do uh, when we're done is I'll make sure Vani and, and the others have copies of the publications that, that I've done that have this illustration in it for anybody who's interested. <clears throat> okay, but you can see here in this illustration how the footfall sequence goes around a circle in the carnivore, whereas in the plant eater, the herbivore goes, it alternates sides. Okay. Now, in terms of art and film and animation and, and screens, there are other things. The position of your eyeballs has to do with what you eat. If you are a carnivore, if you eat meat, if you eat other animals, you're presumably chasing your food. And presumably your food doesn't want to be eaten. So to try and capture your food in three-dimensional space is difficult. So carnivores eyes face forward to provide for them depth perception to try and catch that food. Plant eaters on the other side, well, you know, plants don't run away. So you don't have to worry about that too much. Uh, so instead of having those forward facing eyes, their eyes face to the side because of the, uh, their very long snouts. But it's okay because they don't have to worry about catching their food. And I could go on and on and on about that. In fact, we do uh, uh, seminars and, and uh, workshops on these very topics for both my students and for artists. And we spend hours and days on the, the, the details of these kinds of things. But for today, we're gonna do it quickly uh, because it's time to get into some things that are a little bit more fun, okay? So there is an example of the notes that an artist took when I gave that first horse wolf lecture many, 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 many years ago. This, these were notes that were done by a lady named Denise Shimabukuro and Denise still works in Italy. She's an independent artist and Denise is a brilliant, brilliant uh, uh, illustrator. She can take anything I say or do, whether it's for 30 minutes or three hours or an entire day and reduce it to one piece of A4 paper. She is lovely that way. And these were the notes she took when I first met her many, many, many years ago. We've since cleaned those notes up. 
uh, for publication in a variety of different uh, uh, places, uh, some, some uh, scientific publications, as well as uh, some books. And I will um, make sure to share those with you at the end. And you might notice that those characters look a little bit familiar uh, if you have a little bit of um, uh, um, uh, familiarity with some uh, animation history. The very first film I ever worked on was Beauty and the Beast and the horse and wolf were those characters, Philippe the big Belgian draft horse, and of course the wolves that chased uh, them through the forest. Now, doing that workshop with the Disney animators so, so many years ago uh, was um, uh, a day long process. But I can tell you the basic scientific concept, the basic biological concept that we used for that, I have used over and over and over again for many, many years because the scientific concept stands up and I have to give again give credit where credit's due the artist that I first worked on with this uh, particular film was a gentleman named Russ Edmonds Russ is a fantastic um, animator and illustrator uh, Russ worked on on Philippe the horse before that he did the sheepdog uh, in Little Mermaid uh, he actually owns a sheepdog after he did Philippe he actually bought horses uh, and the uh, the next film he worked on was Lion King uh, and he worked on Nala, um, uh, Simba's mother. And after having bought sheepdogs and horses and then work, worked on a, uh, um, uh, a lion in Lion King and, uh, uh, and, and gorillas in Tarzan, his wife told him that he had to, uh, to cut it out. So, <laughs> well, so there's an example. Right? Now, the example of what you are, what you eat continues. So for example, here, this animal is a carnivore. Uh, it eats meat, it runs a little differently from say a cheetah, but I can tell you that it has more in common than different. So when we do the basic concept and we explain, for instance, that this animal has a more flexible backbone uh, than say a wildebeest, uh, uh, or it has a footfall pattern that is very, very predictable because it eats meat, we can say a lot of generalized things very, very quickly and then get to the nitty gritty details later. And that saves us time. If we understand some basic biology, it saves us an enormous amount of time, especially when we have a diversity of characters. Okay? And as many of you know, who are employed and have, have directors and producers and deadlines, you know that time is money. So the Lion King was the first great example that I had of spending time on a diversity of characters okay, uh, that had a diversity of diets and therefore certain basic patterns for how they moved. So these two animals look very, very different, but I can tell you to me, that you're looking at an herbivore and a carnivore, one of which is barrel shaped and stiffened in its, in its movement. And one is uh, slim, bendy and flexible in its movements. Now, of course, those movements translate to personality when it comes to acting. Okay? Uh, and so it's not a very great leap from basic biology to anatomy, to acting on screen with animated characters. And that's really exciting and really fun. Now, these are some older examples. Uh, Beauty and the Beast and Lion King and those kinds of things were decades and decades ago. I can tell you that very, very similar approaches to that kind of biology we did in just the past couple of years when we worked on the diversity of the animal characters uh, for the Damons in uh, his Dark Materials uh, for BBC HBO. Uh, we did that with Framestore, uh, and uh, even though we were working with digital as opposed to hand-drawn artists, we use some of the same basic biology, uh, which has been a very, very powerful tool for us. Okay. So, so we get to take real animals and move them into film and animation. This is one of my favorite drawings ever. If you look at those two animals there, they look a lot like those two animals there. Okay. Uh, that, by the way, is a caricature of my son uh, many, many years ago when he was only three months old. And I will uh, remind me to tell the story. I'm not going to waste our time now, but remind me to tell the story about this photo at the end, Lani, if, if, if I don't get to it um, before we're done. Okay. Now, what about some examples? Let's have a little bit more fun and a little less uh, uh, teaching uh, for a moment. Uh, and uh, then give you some time for some questions. Uh, th these are examples of the kinds of, of problems that get presented. So I gave you an example. The first problem presented to me, 
horses and wolves. Now in a much broader context, I wind up working on certain categories of things. Sometimes I'm asked to help make realistic animals look real, but of course we don't, we don't always have the opportunity to film them. Sometimes we have to take something that looks quite real and make it act quite cartoony, quite unnaturally. Okay? Sometimes we have very cartoony characters, but understanding motion and movement and anatomy helps, especially when we have to build hybrid creatures. Okay? And finally, we sometimes have very cartoony characters, very funny characters, acting in a way that seems quite natural to us as human beings. And then I'll mention humans very, very briefly at the end, okay? So here's an example uh, of a very realistic looking animal moving in a very realistic fashion. I was very, very fortunate to have a lot of uh, involvement in the film Life of Pi. I actually got to vet the entire script with Ang Lee. Uh, it was a remarkable experience actually. And his first question was like, well, how would a tiger move in a boat? And I was like, I have no idea, but I know how tigers move. And we know how tigers move in unstable environments. So that's where we start, okay? So when we worked on Life of Pi, one of the first shots we worked on were the scene where all of the animals were dumped overboard from the sinking ship. Now that presented us with a question, a problem. What happens when you have a bunch of animals that don't normally spend their time in the water suddenly in this distressing situation? Well, we had to do some research. There is research on how animals swim. And uh, what we did is we figured out where animals float in the water, uh, what kinds of things they do when they swim, what they look like when they're scared. This is all very basic science, okay? It might surprise you to find out that giraffes swim very well. In fact, giraffes are very good swimmers because their lungs are so big, they float well. So here's a picture of some giraffes swimming. The only reason we don't know about this very much is because there aren't many parts of the world where the water is deep enough for them to do so. But I can tell you that I think, as a biologist, I have figured out the origin of the Loch Ness Monster myth. I'm just saying, if you look at a giraffe and you look at that, it's pretty similar. Now, some of you might be laughing at my joke. Some of you might not be. Um, and uh, you can ask me all about Loch Ness monsters and Bigfoots and all those kinds of things. And as a biologist, I will laugh and tell you that they are all people making things up to make money. <laughs> anyway, lots of animals spend time in the water. Lots of animals don't. And we had to put these all together. Okay? Then in the ocean itself, of course, are animals that normally live there. One of the things that was going to be in this film that was edited out because it was a bit too gruesome is that as, as, as all of those animals went overboard, okay, they were in a, uh, a shark infested area. Now we've test driven some of these videos. The video is a bit choppy. Uh, as we beam this all over uh, the world from California to India. So I'm gonna apologize in advance for some, the choppiness of some of this video, but I'm gonna stop it at a certain points to, to give you, uh, make a, a few comments here and there. So let's take a little bit of a look at the, the ship sinking scene from Life of Pi. Now, if you take a look at this shot, you can see that a shark just swam by and there's another shark in your upper left-hand part of your screen. What you don't see here is that farther off to the left was going to be a scene where a shark ran into a hippo and decided it was lunch. It was deemed a bit too gruesome for the film <clears throat> and it was edited out, okay? But what you first saw there was a zebra. Well, the zebra is a, a fancy horse. And when we worked on that animal, it was this right back to where we started. You are what you eat, which means you're gonna have a, a body that moves in a very, very particular fashion. Now, then we added to that after knowing basics about horses, then we added what happens when it breaks its leg, when it falls. We could spend more time on that detail when we learned the basics 
about plant eaters versus meat eaters later on. Okay. Now, uh, what about realistic animals that don't act for real? Sometimes we want an, a character to look funny, even though it looks real, okay? So here are some examples of some real animals. Uh, an elephant walking is very different from say a mouse running because size matters. But we can use elephants walking, say for example, uh, when we try and model what we think dinosaurs did. Uh, when we look at this next uh, clip, you're, I'm gonna show you a clip from uh, Ratatouille. One of my, my, my most fun uh, projects was getting to work with Mark, Mark Walsh at Pixar Studios uh, and figure out a little bit about how rodents run. Now, Remy looks sort of real sometimes on all fours, and then sometimes he goes up on hind limbs. So we had to have an animal that looked like a rat, but did things that rats don't do. But to get it to look like a rat, we had to study rat anatomy and rat locomotion. And what happens is that when you put him on a slippery floor in the kitchen, sometimes he has to move like a rat. And that's what we have in this next scene. So in this particular scene, Remy actually runs like a rat. We were very, very careful about that. Later on, he'll stand on his hind limbs. But what we wanted you to think here is there's a rat in the kitchen. We didn't want you to think there's a cartoon mouse like Mickey Mouse in the kitchen. No, a rat in the kitchen. And to do that, we had to instill enough ratty uh, uh, in information into him to make it work. Now, sometimes we get really, really carried away. Uh, as I told you, big plant eaters uh, and meat eaters move differently. I can tell you big animals like elephants and dinosaurs move very, very differently themselves. Uh, that's an entirely new category of um, uh, information that we work on uh, where I like to say that size matters because it does. Uh, and, and so for examples, elephants can't run. They walk really fast, but they can't run because they're just too big. And I can tell you, by the way, to everybody in India, the landmark work done by this was done by a gentleman named uh, John Hutchinson in India, working with Indian elephants, right? figuring out that they walk quickly, but they don't run. But if you understand how animals run and you understand how elephants are built and you make it run on screen, then it becomes funny. So from the film, George of the Jungle. And so with the help of Jungle King's big gray peanut loving Fuji, George and Ursula set off on a desperate search to find her fiance, that guy she was with. Now we know that elephants can't do that. That's why it's funny. I can tell you that that scene was really hard to do. It was really hard to do. It was hard to do it without breaking the rig constantly. So for those of you who are riggers, you understand what I'm talking about, okay? Now, sometimes we want to do something with a very cartoony character doing very cartoony things. Now, so why would you need a biologist? There have been some films where there was no role for me. Uh, I got to work on a lot of the, uh, the, the the Disney Renaissance films from from Beauty and the Beast up, up through today. Uh, but you know what? They didn't need me for Aladdin. I mean, you don't need me for a genie. He can change his shape into anything he wants. And you just let Eric Goldberg go nuts. Okay. But sometimes you want something inside your cartoony character okay, that's reminiscent of certain kinds of movements that we understand biomechanically. Okay. So here's one of my favorite recent projects. Uh, I got to work on the film Abominable with uh, DreamWorks uh, Animation Studios and Pearl in, uh, uh, in, uh, in Shanghai. Uh, I can tell you that one of my very favorite things to do as a scientist for both my paleontology 
and as someone who works with the animation industry is traveling. And it was really, really fun to travel to China to work on this. Uh, and I'm enjoying traveling to you via Zoom uh, on this particular project. So in Abominable, we had this, uh, uh, this, this Yeti character. Uh, and here's the thing, he's essentially a sphere, but he had to move with four limbs. That was the biological problem presented on this particular. Uh, project. And so what do you do? Now, Abominable and Everest, the character was a great, uh, you know, um, uh, accomplishment in terms of uh, 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 doing hair and lighting and things like that. Uh, we were very pleased that it was uh, a character, uh, of, excuse me, a film that had an all Asian cast. Uh, and so uh, that was great. But this main character was weird. Essentially, I was given the shape of a sphere and told two things. He's got to move with four legs. However, we don't want him to move like a gorilla. We don't want people to think he's a gorilla. He has to be different. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we took his overall shape and we built him a skeleton to start. So that's my drawing of a skeleton in there first. And then this got handed off to the riggers so that they could see where the basic joints happened to be. Now, in fact, I even built some guts in there so we could figure out where the axes would be relative to the outer shell or outline of the character. Okay. We even uh, built in some muscles, not because there were gonna be muscles or, 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 or muscle definition in the character, it was covered by hair, but that helped the animators understand the angles of pull on the elements of the rig, okay? So even in a mythical character, we can do a bunch of biology, okay? Now, the other thing I'll have you notice here, and, and here, 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 by the way, the labels for the actual uh, component elements of this character, one of the things I will tell you is I'm, I'm going to page back here for a moment is that you'll notice that the axis of this animal's body is very deep. There's a lot of stuff here. And this is one of the things that I teach my students in anatomy, both in undergraduate and medical education, as well as in animation. Many, many people think the bones are right next to the surface and they are not. Between the bones, between the joints, in other words, between the pivots in your rig and the outer shell, there is the equivalent of meat, fat, skin, and fur, which means a lot of the time we place our skeletal rigs much too close to the surface of the body and we don't understand why they don't move properly. The reason we did this exercise with Everest was because the rig wasn't working. The rig was too close to the surface of the body. Right? And of course, he had to make faces too. Uh, and we do this whenever we need to do facial expression. As you know, you have to rig a face as much as you have to the rest of the body. And it always helps to understand the biological bases of doing this. So that character there, that sphere, as it moved, we had the tools to make it move but he didn't move like a gorilla. So I'll, I'll see if this will move, work for you. It's, it might be a little bit choppy, but what I can tell you is that gorillas always move their limbs in diagonal couplets, whereas this animal did not. And I thank DreamWorks Animation for, for letting me uh, use that particular shot. Finally, very cartoony characters acting in a way that we might think is normal. So this is real biology. These are people studying the construction of hair in a mammal. In fact, these, were, these are all Disney artists. 
Uh, you can't see me. That's my arm right there, by the way. You don't know what I look like, but that's my hand and arm. These are all Disney artists doing a very, very detailed study of the fur of dozens of different animals at the Los Angeles Museum of Natu uh, County Museum of Natural History uh, here in Southern California. And they were studying the hair for uh, models to understand how light both reflected off and got transmitted through hair. Now that's going a little deep into the weeds, but I can tell you it helps when you have a lot of characters with a lot of hair, like in the film Zootopia. So even though this is a very cartoony film, the hair looks real because we spent so much time on the biology of hair. Now, when I was asked to help with Zootopia, I said, well, they're all walking around like people. What do you want me to help with? They said, fur and faces, fur and faces, fur and faces. Okay. And so you can see here some of the, uh, the steps. Now that was two weeks worth of work. Uh, and I mentioned it in just a couple moments, but I'm sure you all know that one second on screen takes many, many hours to build. So, and finally, <clears throat> what about that when people walk around like, when characters walk around like people? Uh, I'll tell you really, really quickly that human male female construction is important in its differences. This is the uh, famous comedian John Cleese dressing up as a woman. Um, and I got to tell you, I'm an old guy. So when I show pictures of John Cleese, I remember who he is, but many of my students do not. Okay. I can tell you though, that this very dramatic picture of a pregnant woman tells you most of the story because women have hips that are designed to allow a child to pass after pregnancy. So that means that men and women have differently shaped hips, which means they walk differently. Men and women also have different body proportions. This is a much, much, much younger me on my campus here in Southern California with two of my, my uh, all time best students. But I'd like you to notice about our proportions is that um, um, the ladies here, their legs are just as long as mine, if not longer, but their torsos are shorter. That is normal for women. Men have long torsos and, and short legs. Women have short torsos and long legs. So when you add to that the hip differences, we have very, very different uh, body shapes and therefore very different movement uh, for the characters. Uh, as I like to say, men are built like Shrek and women are built like Fiona. Okay. Here are a couple of my colleagues from uh, the University of Sheffield in England. They're the exact same height. They're wearing the exact same shoes. And you can see the, the dramatic body proportion differences. Now, we see this naturally. Uh, this is my uh, first martial arts instructor. I love martial arts as another story that we can talk about later. But look, he is six feet, four inches tall. This lady here is five foot six uh, inches tall. Look at the body proportion differences. Her legs are just as long as his, but look at the torso differences. These are dramatic and we use them in our characters. Okay. Here is another one of Denise's lovely drawings summarizing this for us. And we can see that many of our characters, whether they're cartoony uh, or uh, extreme examples, because we choose extreme examples in our films, follow this model. So human body proportions are well known, but they're still useful and important to us anatomically when we create characters. Okay? So there's another one of Denise's lovely drawing showing human male female proportional differences. And I love this picture here uh, from Guardians of the Galaxy because it shows you just how long the torsos of men are versus the uh, legs of women. Uh, you can see that the uh, uh, Drax the Destroyer and Star-Lord have long torsos and relatively short legs compared with Gamora. Now, I know a lot of you use tools like this. So let me give you a warning. Some of it's very good, some of it's very bad, okay? Uh, the male torso here on, on your right, very well done. The female torso on the left, completely incorrect. And I know a lot of you use these as tools. Uh, I have had to fix lots of characters that were based on these because the women had torsos that were way too long and they couldn't figure out why the females were running around and looking like guys. 
It's because their legs weren't long enough and their hips weren't wide enough. Okay, so be, please be very, very careful. Okay, nothing against these. They are interesting and useful tools, but we have to be critical in the tools that we use because sometimes they are not correct. Uh, <clears throat> here's an example of a character that was originally built based on those tools and moved incorrectly. And when we rebuilt her based on what a female portions actually are, she moved much better. This is from uh, Guerrilla Games uh, Horizon Zero Dawn uh, franchise. And that was a lot of fun because when someone says to me, would you like to go uh, to Amsterdam to work? <laughs> the answer is of course, yes. Okay. Now, what about Judy Hopps from, from Zootopia? She looks like her legs are too short, doesn't she? For, for being a female, but wait a minute, put her next to her, uh, to her, her uh, partner and suddenly she does look more female because relative to him, she does have a shorter torso and proportionately longer legs. So even in very cartoony characters, we can play with these rules, we can play with these tools, okay? So, so in summary, <clears throat> there's a lot of biology and science and anatomy in what we do. I'm very, very grateful to all of you for inviting me here to speak with you today. Uh, there's a laundry list of, of people that I should thank and I'll put them on screen very, very quickly. I do wanna mention some, some people very specifically, of course, uh, everybody who invited me to speak to you today. Uh, I want to give a special shout out to Chris Williams and Rochelle Lewis uh, who got me involved in the Animex uh, project uh, and, and film festival in Northern England many, many years ago. I have met so many people from so many studios uh, including someone I know who's watching right now, Pete Draper. I know you're out there in, in the audience. And I met Pete at Animex in England as well. And he's down in Hyderabad now, uh, along with Badger. And people I've met all over the planet because of Animex and because of animation. Okay? I thank you very, very much. Now, this is important to me. That's my contact, by the way, if you're interested. This is important to me as a scientist. Okay? This is my son. This was this image was done three uh, three days after 9/11 when we were supposed to be working, and we were at Walt Disney World, and the world had changed. Uh, we were working with Disney Feature, and I thought, what kind of world am I bringing my son into? Okay, and I can tell you that when the parks closed and everyone was stranded, you know who the people who saved, they were, were the artists. The artists came into the hotels and drew for the kids and saved their vacations. Animators saving the day. That's my son 19 years ago. That's his younger brother. That's what they look like now. You all are building the world my children are growing up in. There's climate change, there's there are stupid politicians, there are, there's racial injustice, okay? We're working to fix the world and you have the medium. As, as uh, Peter Parker's uncle said, with great power comes great responsibility. And you have that responsibility of building the world in which my children live. And it is my great honor to help you do that uh, and with that, uh, with that, thanks to you uh, as artists, I will um, uh, end that today and I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you. It's really, really, uh, I mean, we, we are not able to stop to question in between, but we are not supposed to interrupt. So actually, uh, it's kind of an I, question. Yeah. I, I just wanted to say for everyone that's watching, can you please... <laughs> do something on your chat window to thank Stuart so that he can actually feel your love because I know that we don't, you know, we are not seeing each other much. and it's, it's a webinar. So everyone out there, please, please just give your love to Stuart for, you know, waking up super early and, you know, sharing this wonderful, wonderful uh, presentation with all of us. It, um, it is my great pleasure. This is this is amazing, Stuart. I mean, I cannot thank you enough for for doing this. Uh, and what a wonderful, wonderful way to end it with you are building the world. Fantastic. Well, you, you are. And, and uh, <laughs> science is important, but scientists are notoriously bad at 
explaining why what they do is important. And one of the things that you all are, are storytellers. Uh -huh. And my profession can learn from you how to tell our stories so that we can communicate that important information to the world. To me, it's very, very important. And it's a lot of fun. Yes, it is. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let RK and uh, Shiva take over the questions. If I have anything, I'll jump in. Uh, but again, okay. to, to all the participants, my request is if you have, if, if you like anything that he says, show the love on your chat box, because that's the only way he can, you know, get excited about being here with all of us on a webinar all the way from Los Angeles. See you guys. I'm right here. Uh, to you, Shiva and RK. Yeah. So we know like you love each and every moment and you, that's what you are mentioning, like you're enjoying each and every what made you to get inside this? And I mean, the work, what you're doing, how you got inside, how you get inspired day to day? Well, yeah. you know, that's, that's a great question. Uh, and uh, and, and uh, many of us are educators. Uh, I'm sure many of you, uh, even as artists, spend so, uh, much of your time training, mentoring, and educating. And when you see someone with whom you've interacted move beyond what you have done, <clears throat> to create this ripple effect that affects many people, it means an enormous amount to you. Um, I've, I've been in situations where uh, former students of mine uh, <clears throat> wound up being nurses. Uh, I had to have surgery on my, my wrist to save my hand because I had a nerve problem. The oh. nurse uh, was a former student of mine. <laughs> and so when you see something like that, you're like, oh my goodness, I'm so happy that you have succeeded in what you do. And when I see artists that I've met, you know, um, you know, many years ago or even recently say, you know, what you set, told me helped me work out a problem in a particular shot that I had to do. Uh, and then they tell me what it is. Then when I see that, that, that moment on screen, it just, it just makes my heart, you know, accelerate, uh, uh, because I know that 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 we're having this effect that's 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 hitting many 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 people, and I know that's not always an easy thing to remember. I know a lot of you have jobs with with horrific deadlines and crunch time and so on, but it's it's important. And I like to remind people that that later on, after you've already taken your break and you're trying to rest, that the rest of the world is watching what you've done and appreciating it. Uh, so, so that's that. It's it's that perspective that I learned to have that helps keep me going day to day. So. Wow, wow, wow! Uh, apart of uh, Everest character, like uh, which is the best character that you loved very much? Oh goodness, that's really hard. No so controversies, but yeah, <clears throat> I like there are so many. Personally. There's but I can tell you that I, uh, there are a variety of answers to that. I can tell you that as a, a project, um, I'm, I remain very, very um, um, uh, fond of, of the work we did in Beauty and the Beast uh, and, and Lion King. I can tell you that one of the most influential characters I ever worked on, interestingly enough, has been Spirit, uh, the horse from Spirit, Stallion of the Cimarron. Yeah. All over, I go all over the world and people stop me saying how much they love that horse. Um, yeah. And and so that's that's very gratifying to me. Um, I can tell you that one of the most interesting um, uh, tasks set to me was when we worked on Remy in, in, in um, uh, Ratatouille because there was this balancing act that Mark Walsh, uh, who was the supervising animator for that, Mark had to walk this tightrope of a character that talked and could be sort of cartoony but still um, had to be enough like a rat that you didn't get comfortable with him in the kitchen. They didn't want you comfortable with him in the kitchen because that was part of the tension of the film. And so that was a really fascinating project. And by the way, to give credit where credit's due again, um, uh, that project started in the green room at the Animex Film Festival in Middlesbrough, England. Um, and it, went, it wound its way all the way uh, back to uh, um, Emeryville, California. Uh, most recently, I can tell you as a paleontologist, um, when I talk to the folks at ILM about dinosaurs, that's pretty fun. <laughs> <laughs> what can I say? <clears throat> now, now, okay, I will tell you this. Um, 
since I was eight years old, I've been doing martial arts. That that very tall Asian fellow I told you is my first karate instructor uh, and to whom I owe more than I can even explain to you. Um, so when I get a call from a studio saying, we're gonna do martial arts and animation, I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> so, so the film Cats and Dogs, where we had ninja cats, super, yeah. super fun. Yeah. Um, the, uh, when the first Mulan film, where we had animation and, and martial arts, massively fun. Uh, I did a little bit of work on the, the upcoming Mulan film, but none, none of the martial arts, that was, all, that was all actual live actors, of course, but we uh, worked on some of the uh, animal characters in the upcoming Mulan. So yeah, martial arts, animation, uh, <laughs> and anatomy, that, that's pretty great. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Cats dogs, amazing. Uh, which is the most critical project for you? Which Pardon has me? given critical project, which has given much challenge to you? Oh, okay. Uh, I, you mentioned earlier um, uh, how to train your dragon. Uh, Anything with flying characters is very, very challenging uh, because as many animators and, 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 and modelers and you all know that giving the feeling of mass and weight, when you push, you give the feeling of pushing against the ground, you can, you can give that feeling. It's very hard to do that when you're in the air. So anything that flies or anything that swims is a little tougher to do that, but flying is the hardest because flight is biomechanically very, very complicated. I can tell you that the first film I ever worked on with that was Stuart Little 2, and, and we didn't do that great a job. But the How to Train Your Dragon films were, uh, and again, credit where credit's due, Simon Otto, uh, as the supervising animator, said, and I quote, every wing beat in this must be one that would work in real life. He was extremely careful and I give him an enormous amount of credit. And so the work that we did on How to Train Your Dragon, very, very uh, uh, challenging, but I was, I can say very, very gratifying. Uh, we worked on a very cartoony films in parallel with that. Uh, I worked on Rio with uh, Blue Sky. And even though it's very cartoony, again, with flying characters, with birds, very, very challenging. But also if you get it right, extremely gratifying. Amazing. Uh, uh, small question. I, I think like might sound silly. What is the duration of the research that you spend per character? Ooh. <laughs> uh, well, in Jitopia, you mentioned two weeks to have a study on hair. Is it only research part or is it? it, it it's, you know, it, it's very, it, it, it's, it's, it's quite variable. It depends on, on the amount of time the artists are given and the amount of um, uh, 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 time they have for the actual film, uh, in fact. So uh, when I first worked on Beauty and the Beast, it was just a couple of days. Uh, when I worked on Lion King, I actually uh, lived in a hotel next to the studio for for weeks. Um, uh, and then they sent me to the Florida studio and I lived there for a week. Uh, and uh, on Spirit, we spent um, uh, six months where I would go down to the studio once a week for six months uh, and do a different talk on, on something every, every, every week. Uh, in other cases, it's sometimes less. So for example, I've had the great fortune of getting to work with a number of companies outside of the uh, uh, United States, uh, in the UK and in, 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 a, in, other, in Germany and other countries, uh, Canada and so on. And sometimes there, we just have to work very, very fast. So um, when I work with uh, MPC or Framestore in London uh, or ILM, they're all in London. Uh, I will sometimes work with three or four different studios in a week uh, wow. where I will um, work eight to 10 hours a day uh, and for a few days in one studio, jump over to another studio for a couple days. And at the end of a week or a week and a half, I am uh, gratified, excited, and exhausted. Um, uh, so um, similar things happen in Canada when we go to Montreal or Vancouver, because of course I do have a regular job at the university. And those kinds of trips are trips that I take uh, and on term breaks or and, and, you know um, holidays or, or something like that. But you know what? I love to travel. Uh, so it's worth it to me. 
Uh, and I know we none of us can travel right now, so I appreciate that we're traveling to one another uh, via Zoom. <laughs> but but we, we get to meet each other, so yes. uh, traveling, yes, yes. Okay. That is that is to me some of the most important things we do. Um, I, I wish more people in my country reached out to more other people in other countries and got this perspective. Yes. Um, but I do think that the films you make help. I guess I do think the films that, that you as artists make help. Yes. So uh, here I will uh, over to Shiva. There are lots of question and answers from the, I mean, uh, audience. So Shiva, please, can you take over? Thank you, Arkigaru. And uh, uh, Stuart, uh, that was a awesome session. Uh, and we have Thank got you. like a lot of overwhelming response uh, and they're conveying thanks and gratitude to you. So yeah, so we have many questions. We'll try to cover as many as possible quickly. I'll do my best. <laughs> yeah. So here's the first question by Manoj Minan. Uh, it's a fantastic uh, piece of information. Knowing the fact that humans have an adopting ever evolving food habit, can we apply the same thought to humans and apply body structure, gut size to nomads, Vikings, okay. and men who predominantly so, so, are eating meat? So that rule, you are what you eat, doesn't work for people so much. Um, you are what you eat works for quadrupedal mammals for the most part, four-legged mammals, but it works for about 80% of them, which is a pretty good rule uh, when you think about it, if it covers that many different animals, because we aren't trained, we're not veterinarians, right? We, we're not trained to know that diversity of animals. What's the most important thing with people, because people are designed to be omnivores. We eat plant material, but we eat other things as well. We eat high protein uh, food uh, as well. Some people eat meat, other people eat soy and other things that are much more high protein. We are omnivores. So in fact, if you look at us in terms of our body weight, our digestive tracts are about intermediate between that of a strict herbivore and a strict carnivore because we're designed to eat almost anything which is very convenient. That's one of the reasons the human species is so very, very successful. But the thing that is the most dominant and important rule for people is whether you're male or female. Those limb length and hip um, uh, size uh, things are the, are the rules that really dominate the way we teach about human uh, biology. So that's the first thing. And then age, because body proportions, <clears throat> excuse me, Body proportions, as you, I'm sure you all know, are very different between youngsters, between children and adults. And we use this all the time. We give our, our young characters these big heads and these big eyes, and they're all sorts of ways of making something look young. But the features that are most important for quadrupedal animals are diet and size. The thing that are most important for people are whether you're male or female or whether you're young or adult. Uh, so what I like to say is my, my, uh, my five most important rules for animators are, you are what you eat if you're an animal. Size matters because if you're very large or very small, then things change. For people, are you male or female? Or are you an adult or a child? And then finally, rule number five is that when we build mythical creatures, we have to remember the first four rules. Because most mythical creatures are built out of pieces we already know. <laughs> That's awesome. Cool. Thank you, uh, Stuart. So another question by Manoj Minan. Uh, I always had a doubt when I saw T-Rex Jurassic Park and then saw a true <laughs> different version of another T-Rex in uh, Peter Jackson's uh, King Kong. Which one is more believable to you as a paleontologist? Um, neither. <laughs> okay, so here's the thing. Uh, in both Jurassic Park and in, in, uh, in King Kong, all of the dinosaurs move much more quickly than they ever could have. Here's the thing. Size does matter. If you're as big as a T-Rex or as big as a sauropod dinosaur or anything else like that, if you fall going that fast, you would explode like a piece of fruit if you hit the ground, okay? Size does matter. Remember I mentioned earlier that elephants can't run. They're too big. If you were to take a mouse and drop it from the top of your building, it would not die. It would be stunned, but it would not die. 
If you dropped an elephant from five to 10 feet, it would die of massive internal injuries. They can't go that fast. They are too big. Okay. So um, they moved too fast. Now their shapes were fine. And the whole idea of, 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 of King Kong and a, and a, um, a T-Rex hanging from vines in the jungle fighting in, in, in Peter Jackson's film, we just laughed a lot. But I've been waiting to see T-Rex fight with King Kong all my life, so I didn't care. <laughs> so it depends on what our goals are. If we're just making a monster movie, well, I guess we'll do that, okay? Uh, yeah. I can tell you that in terms of the movies um, that where the dinosaurs looked great and moved great. There is an unsung terrible film called The Land Before Time that was done by Rhythm and Hughes. The dinosaurs in that were superbly designed. You could even see their rib cages moving when they breathed. Unfortunately, of course, we all know that after Life of Pi, uh, Rhythm and Hughes mostly went away. Um, I know there are bits and pieces of Rhythm and Hughes still in other parts of the world. But those dinosaurs, um, they were named Grumpy, was the name of the T-Rex in, in Land Before Time. If you can find that film, it's very well done. Very, very well done. Okay. Thanks, so, so next question is by Badger. Uh, I believe you were involved as a consultant in both the original Jurassic Park movies, as well as uh, the more recent uh, Jurassic World films. Between the times of these films, has there been any changes or new discoveries that may have meant that elements from the original film are no longer accurate? Well, that's a great question. Um, now, I can, to give credit where credit's due, the first Jurassic Park film, as you probably know, most of the tools you had didn't exist. There was no Maya, there was no ZBrush, there were none of those things, right? So the things that the, the artists and, and engineers and scientists accomplished in the first Jurassic Park films remain remarkable, to be fair. Um, probably the single most important scientific discovery um, that we know of for sure that really has changed things uh, is that we now know that the vast majority of meat-eating dinosaurs, what we call the theropods, the big carnivores, everything from Allosaurus to T-Rex to Velociraptor probably had feathers. And um, we knew this to, um, as the, the, the Jurassic Park films were being made. Uh, and then of course, when we came back to Jurassic World, this was pointed out to the directors and producers that, you know, uh, Velociraptor has feathers. We have found the feathers. Uh, and, their, and their response was, well, does the public really know? And my answer is like, yes, every child in the world knows. <laughs> Kids know more about dinosaurs than adults. Um, uh, but the decision was made to keep the dinosaurs looking the way they were so that there was continuity between uh, the earlier films and the later films. And to be honest, feathers are really hard to do. Doing feathers is really, really tough. Uh, a hair has a, a couple dozen variables in terms of shape and light, but a feather has hundreds. Uh, and anyone who's ever had to model feathers will just tell you that um, uh, they have no hair left because they pulled it all out. So, 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 so the lack of feathers is probably the single greatest difference and so-called error in the new films. But you know, they're monster movies, so we're we're, we're good with it. <laughs> Thank you. So we have a couple of uh, interesting questions from Badger. I'll go through them quickly. Have you ever had times working on these films where your knowledge and expertise end up in conflict? with the director's vision for <laughs> how, how he wants the film to look. How it All, the time. All the time. So, so uh, I can talk as much as I want, but they don't have to listen. Now I can tell you this, uh, and to, again, to give credit where credit's due, I know that time is sometimes limited um, and, uh, and, and, and uh, budgets are sometimes limited. My general experience is that the artists almost always want to get it as correct as possible. And I, and I sort of relate to them at that level, um, but sometimes they don't have the time. Uh, and, uh, and so, um, uh, so uh, 
there have there have been some times where I've made certain suggestions that that we we knew um, uh, weren't going to uh, be incorporated. Uh, but my my you know my rationalization for that uh, is that um, well I know mice don't talk, you know, and I know that cats don't really do martial arts. So okay. <laughs> Um, now, now, if I'm asked to help on something that is supposed to be documentary level correct, then I can be very, very aggressive. Like, um, so I was once asked to help on the Walking with Dinosaurs projects. Uh, and I, I actually had to step out of it because uh, they were purporting to do a documentary and they were, some of the information was incorrect. Um, Got it. Uh, <laughs> so um, there have also been times when I've had to say, look, I'm not the right person. I, I lose my credibility if I pretend to do something I cannot. So for instance, I was asked to work on Bugs Life and I said, I don't really know Bugs very well, but I know some people who do. And so I made sure that they spoke to the right people. So that, that's, that's the more common uh, issue for me. I don't want to pretend to do something I can't do because that ruins my credibility. If I always make sure you get the right person, even if it's not me, then I maintain my credibility. So. Well, Stuart, that's great. Thank you. I'll move on to the like, other questions quickly. Mm, what would you say is the golden rule or piece of advice for CZ artists uh, from the following? Is it a uh, like creature design or rigging an animals that exist or rigging an animal that doesn't exist? or uh, making a margarita? Aha, the latter. <laughs> the margarita, because I make the world's best margaritas. I'm just saying, no. <laughs> okay, uh, I, I do live in Southern California. Like where you live, it's a fairly warm climate. And so I have citrus trees in my backyard, oranges and limes and things like that. And because of that, I make fabulous margaritas. If we set the margaritas aside, um, I do think it's very, very important to understand real animals before creatures. And here's why I say this, this is very important because I get lots and lots and lots of, of uh, portfolios from students. And the very first thing they do is they do a creature. And I tell them, can that creature walk? You know, the most common thing I see is usually an anime style female creature with hooves and wings and a sword that's so giant, she could never lift it, right? And I say, can that character exist in the universe in which you put it? The way we learn if it can or not is we start with the real animals because most mythical creatures are built out of parts of animals or people we already know. So if you start with things you already know, you can see if those things work before you make something mythical. So for instance, when we worked on Chronicles of Narnia, we had these centaur-like characters that were part human, part horse. So we studied humans and horses first, and then we figured out the sort of the best places to sew them together. And if you figure out the best place to sew them together, it's usually because you studied the real thing first. And so I do think that it helps to look at real things before you start in on your creature construction. So oh, great, thank you, Stuart. So, has there been a film or a show that you haven't worked on that you have seen and you wished you had worked on it? Either Iron Giant. It's so good. Yeah. Which are they? Iron Giant. Iron Giant is such a fabulous film. Oh my gosh. It is one of my favorite animated films ever. I had nothing to do with it. I know some people who worked on it because I've met enough people in the industry now. Uh, the, um, uh, 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 the CG supervisor on that, Scott Johnston, was the same person as a CG supervisor um, on Lion King. So I had known him, and he is also the partner of Charles Solomon, who is the person who in, in, invited me into this world. Uh, but Iron Giant, I would say, is one of the landmark films that is I, I admire remarkably, even though I've had nothing to do with it. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, so, uh, we have another question. How do you feel about uh, moments of fantastic characters like Avatar? Does their uh, motion bother you in any way or uh, you buy it completely? This is by Ketan Adhikari. 
Well, okay, you know, as I'm sure is the case with all of you, you can probably look at a scene and dissect it in your minds the way an average audience would not, okay? So usually what I do when I watch a film is I try to watch it the first time and just be a fan or an audience member, unless I worked on it, okay? Yeah. But, uh, and then I'll, and then if I watch it a second or a third time, then I will start tearing it apart, okay? Uh, I can tell you that the things that the two things that are the areas where I find greatest criticism when I find a character that I, 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 I'm not comfortable with um, is when you, it doesn't have that feeling of weight and mass, which is important to do. Um, so it means that we also have to study some math and some physics, of course. Um, and so when I see a character that's very light and, it, and when it hits the ground, it doesn't have that feeling of reaction to its environment those are the things that that immediately jump out at me okay the other thing is this and it's going to look a little uh, gruesome when i do this i'm going to get close to my screen and do this with my eyes see how much white that you see around the whites of my eyes this is a human thing when we do that to animal eyes it makes me crazy think of your pets think if you have a cat or a dog, or if you've seen a horse or something like that, when you see an animal like that, you see mostly the color of their eyes. Humans are very different in that way because of the construction of our faces. And we use that as part of our communication. Uh, there's a lot of um, uh, uh, non-vocal communication that goes with our faces. You, I don't need to speak. I can say I'm happy, but I can say the same thing like this. Okay. because of my eyes. When we put human eyes into animal characters, it makes me crazy. And everybody tells me, isn't, isn't uh, Planet of the Apes amazing? It is a technological masterpiece. But those apes are not apes. They are people in ape suits because they have people eyes. And I don't care what Andy Serkis says. He knows nothing about apes. He knows nothing about how they move and about how they emote because his eyes are all wrong. I'm sorry. Oh, sure. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, we have some uh, fan art by uh, one of our attendee. Uh, maybe I'll show, I'll bring it up in the end. Okay. Now, just RK Garu to uh, yeah. like uh, take some questions. Thank you, Shiva. Sure. Um, Stuart, I got a surprise for you. And here is Mr. <laughs> Here is Pete Rapper. Pete, now you can talk to your old, good old friend. Hey, Stu, how are you doing, mate? Um, well, thank you. So, hey. so uh, I can tell you all that I've known Pete for many years, and when he went off to India, I thought, now he's even farther away from me, but I can also <laughs> tell you that Pete and I have shared some adventures together, both in the UK and in California. Oh, that's totally true. And just to comment on what Stuart was claiming earlier about him making the best margaritas on the planet, that is actually a fact. Oh, wow. <laughs> that is a total, Thank you, total Pete. fact. Yeah, Thank that, you that, very that, much. That, that has been credited by uh, numerous individuals, myself included, and uh, the hangovers also go to prove it. Wow. <laughs> now, now, one of the great things about hanging out with folks like Pete is that although Pete is a technologically very, very uh, sophisticated artist, um, he's also, by the way, I don't know if, how many of you know it, he's also an author and an educator, and he's written a number of books. Uh, and, the, and when I first met him, I met him in England, and, and, and the director of Animex at the time, uh, Chris Williams said, oh yeah, this guy, he's written all these books. He's gonna do these workshops on, on how to use all these programs. I thought, oh, he's an academic like me. And when I met him, like I couldn't even keep up with him. Uh, <laughs> and so he has taken me on pub crawls in Northern England. He's taken yeah. me on pub crawls in Bristol, England. Yeah. And he has- Oh, I forgot about that one. Yeah. Yeah, me and uh, Chris and you, yeah, yeah, in the center of it. Oh, I completely forgot about that. And, and, and he's hung out with me next to my swimming pool in my home at Southern yep. California. Oh, so, I've got a so, so, so I've got a question for you, mate. Okay, so what yeah. was your contributing input on Verhoeven's Hollow Man? Okay, now I have to give credit where credit's due. Okay, a lot of that work was not done by me. It was done by my wife, Elizabeth, because she is a human anatomy specialist. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I was originally brought in by Walt Heinemann because their backbone wasn't working well. Okay. Yeah. 
And Beth went in there and tore that character apart because they had used a bunch of inappropriate pieces. Uh, for instance, they had a female hip inside of, 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 of there. Uh, and as it turns out, um, uh, Kevin Bacon has flat feet. Right. So, so the foot skeleton <laughs> they put in uh, didn't fit inside of his feet and all yeah. sorts of things like that. But they wouldn't use a, um, uh, a, a, a 3D scan of his body. So they had to mm. model in the entire skeleton. So I had a little bit to do with the gorilla and the backbone uh, because it was sort of flopping on like a fire hose uh, and the ribs kept inter, uh, um, uh, interpenetrating. But to give mm. credit where credit is due, Beth, uh, Elizabeth Riga, my wife, uh, uh, spent an enormous amount of time fixing the skeleton in that film. Uh, and, yeah. um, and because of that, she's actually seen um, um, Kevin Bacon in his underwear. <laughs> <laughs> so, so she's half a degree from Kevin Bacon. She wins. She wins the game. Actually, she wins the game. Totally won the game. Because okay, and so Pete, you know, I've seen this because I've seen this in some of your your talks and your lectures. You know, you remember when you taught me how to use the um, the the reflective sphere? Yeah. Uh, as a okay, uh, as a yeah. tool. Well, I have. Uh, she has done that with Kevin Bacon. Oh. <laughs> and she, she drew the grid. She drew the grid onto his body. Yeah, with with mascara. <laughs> so yeah. the other the other query about that was that if I remember correctly, you told me once that you got called into a, you were you were you were, you were pulling food out or something like that. You were at a seminar and they were they were they were uh, discussing about the transformation effect about how he reappears. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, so you know which one I'm talking about. Yes, I do. So so Hollow Man was done by Sony Pictures Image Works, and at the exact same time, uh, we were working on the first Harry Potter film, um, and uh, on one of the Stuart Little films. Okay, and uh, and this and and so I and Sony Pictures Image Works is in Southern California but it's some distance from my home. So I was just hanging out there after having done a Stuart Little lecture on birds and feathers. Uh, and so I was waiting out traffic uh, and I was just said, can I use one of your, your, um, um, you know, your conference rooms to just go work on my laptop? And they put me in a conference room, which apparently had a hollow man meeting in it and in walked Verhoeven and a whole bunch of other people. And they said, oh, but this guy does anatomy. This, you can ask him questions. And I said, okay. And, and I worked a little bit with Walt Heinemann on this. And of course, Beth had done most of the work. But, but I said, yeah, I'll answer whatever questions you have. He said, well, I have this great idea that, that, um, that when he re-injects himself to, 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 to come you know, visible again, that, that you know, his, you know, um, you know, you're going you're gonna, you know, he, his, his, his to have a disembodied hand. That's all you'll see after he injects himself. I said, "Well, that's not how it works because veins don't go that way; they they go that way." That way. And so, yeah. um, and so, uh, you know, so so what you'll see is it'll go back to his heart, and and then the first thing the heart will go to will be the brains and the eyes, and that'll be really cool, and it'll be really gross. And he says, "Well, gross is good, but I want the hand." I said, "Well, okay, that you can do whatever you want, but that's not how it works." Um. Uh, and he says, well, it's not my vision of how veins work. And I said, well, I teach human anatomy and your vision's wrong. And it's sort of stupid. <laughs> and, and I'm... <laughs> and I, I, was I, 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 I can't remember if you got the credit on that or not. I offended, I'd offended a, 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 a director, but then everybody told me that they were really happy I had. Yeah. <laughs> because that's what happened in the end, if I remember correctly. That, that's exactly what happened. It went in, went to the heart, it went to the brain, it went to the eye. So they took exactly what you... What you and it looked said. really creepy, which yeah. is creepy is good. Um, but so I just went back to doing little um, uh, little walking mice and birds for, for Stuart. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly a good idea. <laughs> anyway, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave you guys to it. Anyway, lovely to speak to you, mate. Uh, according to Badger, uh, it's your birthday tomorrow. I haven't got it listed down in my calendar, unfortunately. So happy birthday for tomorrow from both of us and from everyone. And everyone of the company. I, th wow, I, think, wow. I, I, think, I think some of our guys are also on here as well. I've told everybody to, 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 
to watch. So happy birthday from Cheers, all of thank us. Thank you very much. And it's great have a to great hear one, from you. And, and give Badger my best as well. Oh, so. oh he's, he's listening. He's listening. Thank you, Badger. Hey, Badger. <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, last one, but Pete is our Indian hero. He made oh, shut the up, okay. thing <laughs> what VFX was happening over here. Thank I'll, you, Pete. I'll, Thank you for joining. RK, Thanks for RK joining us. Much, much RK appreciate was the it. first person to uh, interview us when we first formed the company, if you remember. Oh, that's about right. About 10, 10 plus years ago. Yeah. So you were the first yeah. person to actually uh, put, put us uh, put us uh, in press, mate. Wow, time flies. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it totally does. All right, so have a Thank cool you, one, Pete. mate. Take care yourself. Thanks, Pete. Take I, care. Thank All you, right. Thank you. Bye. 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 Cheers, okay. So, yeah, so, and uh, from all the participants and the panelists, we wish you a happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. So, so uh, well, this is um, a great birthday present for me, so. Right, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Uh, tomorrow we'll see with the present, hopefully. <laughs> uh, so Shiva, have you left with any other questions? Uh, I think uh, we pretty much covered uh, and it's already uh, like one and a half hour through the webinar. So uh, like, uh, I, I think uh, uh, if you, what about you Stuart? Like, would you like to take one or two more questions? Uh, sure, I'd be happy to do that. Maybe yeah. I'll make it like quick, couple of them. Um, can you suggest that if I want to make an animation on a unicorn, which animal anatomy should I study on? Okay, well, so the, the most unique animals to try to animate are the ones that, of course, we can't see anymore. So any extinct animal is difficult to do. Um, uh, so uh, if you're looking to uh, do something that makes you unique, um, choosing an animal that's never been animated before, of course, is is, is uh, uh, a great idea. However, I have a very good friend and Pete knows this person as well, by the way, uh, and, and, and she's a mutual friend and she has a great piece of advice. And that person is a lady named Rochelle Lewis and Rochelle is a recruiter, she, she crews films. And when she looks at portfolios, what she says is I don't necessarily look at what's being animated. I'm looking to see if it's being animated in an interesting way. So for example, if she looks at a walk cycle of a human or a cat or a dog or a horse, she doesn't see, look to see if the walk cycle is perfect. She can recognize that pretty quickly. She looks to see if there's anything interesting going on. So maybe that, that person is walking along and stops and looks around or moves their head in a different or unusual way. Or maybe during that walk cycle, the character stops does something, has a gesture or something like that. Here's a great example. Back in the um, uh, uh, film Lion King, all the wildebeests come pouring down the mountain. They're all computer generated. So they are all the same and they look great, but there's one wildebeest that shakes its head as it comes down. That was done by Eric Goldberg and he had to hand animate that because it had to do something different. And everybody remembers that one. Everybody who works on the film remembers that wildebeest because Eric added that little bit of acting into it. So you can be technically very good, but don't forget that you are also an actor. Sure, great sort, thank you. And uh, like uh, next question uh, by Anmol, what would be great books to study the animal uh, anatomy of animals? Okay. <laughs> There are lots of good books out there, but they're, they're quite variable in, in their construction. We are working on one that, now there are lots of anatomy for artists books out there. Uh, and most of them are very, very static, okay? And so unfortunately for animation, we're, we need something that's dynamic and moving. Uh, and so uh, we are working on a, on a book that's going to have lots of step cycles and walk cycles and, and running and, and moving and flying in it. But that's, and, and we're working on it, I promise. <laughs> uh, but uh, if there were one book for me to recommend, I would recommend getting uh, some of the older German um, uh, comparative anatomy texts. They're in German, but they're beautifully illustrated. 
uh, uh, Wiedersham is, is a, uh, an old fashioned book from way, 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 way back, but the illustrations are lovely. There is a great book on animal comparative anatomy whose last name, the artist's last name is Cardong, K-A-R-D-O-N-G. The author's name is Ken Cardong. That's the book I teach with at the university. Now in the artistic end of things, there's lots of uh, anatomy for artists books of varying quality. Uh, and you just have to make sure you have a critical eye. If you look at a, a book where the musculature comes right to the edge of the skin, it means they haven't remembered that there's fat and, and fur there. So use a critical eye. Um, uh, I can tell you some of the artists that I know that I think do a superb job. Um, and a lot of them work in, in, in reconstruction of animals like dinosaurs. So I can tell you that the artwork that I think is really well done in that regard are done by certain people. Uh, I showed you that illustration by Michael Skrepnik, S-K-R-E-P-N-I-C-K, and his website's beautiful. Uh, David Krentz, K-R-E-N-T-Z. David Krentz was the character designer on the Disney dinosaur film on many dinosaur projects for the Discover Channel. Uh, and he was also the uh, um, uh, storyboard artist for Guardians of the Galaxy. Uh, he's a really talented artist. Anything that David Krentz does, superb. Okay, superb. Also Mark Hallett, H-A-L-L-E-T, uh, also superb, uh, superb work. So they, they don't have books necessarily, but their illustrations are in many books. And if you see their work, you will not go wrong. Sure, Stuart, thank you very much. And uh, I will take one last question before we uh, like end this. Um, when you... Uh, if you got to work on any character, which one do you prefer to prepare first, anatomy or character? Well, um, that's a great question because one of the things that happens is that sometimes I'll be told we need to build a certain kind of animal. Other times I'll be told we have a character we've designed. You need to tell us how it moves. Uh, <laughs> so, so either one works. It's easier for me to tell you how a real animal works, but it's a more exciting challenge for me to be given a character and figure out how it works. And that is what, and of course, that's what we have to do when we have hybrid or mythical characters. So for example, Spirit, the horse was a fantastic project where we did this incredibly deep dive. I know no more ho about horses than I ever did before I started that film. On the other hand, working on a film like um, Abominable, where I was presented the shape of a character and we had this problem to solve about how that shape would move and, and a, do it in a convincing way, was sort of like being an engineer. Here's your problem, now solve it. So it's a very different and exciting kind of thing. Uh, they just take a, a, a very different kind of approach. So they're, they're both quite valid. Uh, and I'm very fortunate that over the years I've, I've had the opportunity to do both. So. Sure. It's Stuart. So uh, I well, just wanted to say to one, one quick thing to, to the rest of the participants. If there's anybody working at a studio or eventually will work at a studio, uh, please reach out to Stuart on his LinkedIn. I have uh, posted a little link over here. I'll do it again. Uh, stay connected um, and, you know, reach out to Stuart whenever you need any kind of, you know, uh, a consultant to help you uh, further your Thank you. development. Thank you, Stuart. And this is Thank fantastic. Thank you, you for you coming. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, it's, it's been a honor. great time. Um, uh, <laughs> this is uh, the best birthday present I could, 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 could get. So, so Pete gave that away, but, but thank you very, very much. Sure. So here is uh, like a fan art. Quickly, I'm going to share it for a couple of seconds. Can you see my screen, Stuart? Uh, <laughs> that's, I love it when people do caricatures of me. I really, really do. Uh, that's lovely. That is absolutely yeah. lovely. Thank you. Uh, uh, that's from Milan. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Stuart. Have thank a good rest much, of everybody. your weekend. And, and thank have you, a everyone, for coming in. The rest of your holiday. Okay. And enjoy. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Enjoy. Bye. 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 Bye.